My name is Viviana Gabello. The aim of this presentation is to introduce you to the theory and methodology that can be applied when translating, uh, especially when translating collocations from a systemic functional perspective and typically uh, content-driven language learning contexts. I'll very briefly discuss the key approaches and models that foster the integration of translation into content-driven language pedagogy, and I'll refer to some contexts of application before concluding. In the history of foreign language learning, as we all know, uh, the pendulum has swung back and forth between focus on language analysis and focus on language use, with translation having a decreased impact on foreign language learning as the pendulum swung towards language use. Translation was considered either essential, for instance, in the frame of the grammar translation method, or detrimental in the context of various communicatively oriented approaches. However, in recent years, an increasing number of pleas for instance, Howard and Widdison in 2004, Carreras in 2007, myself in 2009, Cook in 2010, and Leviosa in 2014, uh, to name just a few. An increasing number of pleas have been made for a more balanced examination of the use of translation in foreign language teaching. But what is the real problem in foreign language pedagogy? The problem is monolingualism. Despite the overwhelming force of the arguments and evidence in favor of bilingual language teaching in a globalized multilingual world, many curricula, many institutions, many syllabuses and material designers, as well as teachers, parents, and of course also students, remain committed to monolingual teaching. This is what Guy Cook and Graham Hall uh, say in their uh, 2012 article on language use in language teaching and learning state of the art. Actually, there is a section in their article that they've titled Entrenched Monolingualism in ELT, um, in which they express their total criticism of both monolingualism and content-based language teaching. Um, this section reads, a notable manifestation of diehard monolingualism strangely posing as a new approach is content-based language teaching. Another quotation worth reading refers to a specialized context um, law in this case, uh, in which even the domain experts find monolingualism as the first issue to be tackled and warn against it in very clear terms. Um, they say the tendency towards monolingualism subjects comparative legal studies to the jeopardy of all monoculture, sterility. But how to use translation in foreign language teaching, or better, how to use translation in content-driven language pedagogy? While well, literature abounds in writings about translation as the fifth skill in foreign language teaching, very little consideration has been given to the use of translation in content-based or content-driven language pedagogy. I'll start by referring to a theory of linguistic interdependence by Jim Cummings, the University of Ontario. According to him, two languages are like two separate icebergs, but only apparently because under the surface they belong to the very large piece of ice. This submerged area is what Cummings defines as the uh, CUP, the Common Underlying Proficiency. What does that mean? It means that knowledge of a language at levels higher than colloquial use uh, I mean, knowledge at a more academic level, provides the mind uh, with resources to acquire a second language, and a third, and a fourth, and so on. 
because the skills that require greater cognitive efforts, such as reading, writing, content learning, abstract thinking, and problem solving, are common to all languages and use this area of knowledge. This hypothesis nicely fits with recent findings from functional neuroimaging studies focusing on language processing in bilinguals. These studies, conducted by Sulpizio del Maschio, Fedeli and Abu Talebe in 2020, confirm functional overlap between domain general and bilingual language control networks in language switching and point to a shared neural network for L1 and L2 with few differences depending on the linguistic level. Particularly significant for our discussion is the comparison of the results for lexical semantic processing in L1 and L2. The findings of these studies advance our understanding of the neuronal mechanisms involved in bilingual language processing and confirm the interdependence of L1 and L2, which brings us to reconsider how we should help learners achieve and organize such knowledge of L2 that might, might resonate with their L1 so that they can activate both the shared semantic system and the separate lexical spaces. What we need is a reference model that will guide us to identify the competences needed to carry out specific real life tasks and turn the model into an operational map of individual learning instances that might address the needs emerging from the needs analysis conducted as a starting point of our curriculum or uh, syllabus design. Uh, the concept of need analysis I refer to is the one proposed by Dud Levens and St. John's in 1998 because it encompasses previous approaches and can be extended to host new needs and methodologies. It includes an all-encompassing rubric of indicators that make cater well for a needs analysis applied to content-driven language pedagogy but was still full short as it should be complemented with more specific indicator, indicators aiming to address the needs of today's connected learners. Uh, that is the additional building blocks shown on this uh, slide. The first one is learners information fluency that is the learner's level of digital literacy and that integrates the ability to collect the information necessary to consider a problem or issue, the abilities to employ critical thinking skills in the evaluation and analysis of the information and its sources, and the ability to formulate domain-specific logical conclusions and present those conclusions in an appropriate and effective way. Uh, the second building block is the learner's computer-mediated communication skills, that is the learner's ability to initiate and maintain dialogue online, to construct an argument, compare opposing arguments, make judgments online, to share ideas, opinions, etc., and can construct knowledge online. Um, this skill integrates the ability to contextualize the, inf the information fluency, uh, but not only uh, in computer-mediated interactive communicative exchange, and therefore um, it projects the individual dimension onto a virtual social dimension of communication. The third building block is the learner's epistemic fluency. Uh, that is to say, the abilities, uh, predispositions and practices involved in combining multiple ways of knowing, where 
epistemological beliefs are not fixed traits that reconfigurable mental resources. The information gathered from the need, uh, needs analysis are used to define program goals. However, the definition of specific teaching objectives that also include translation and not only language learning can be better achieved by referring to this translation competence model. This is a model I re developed in 2009 to fully describe the difference between um, language and translation competence. I'm not going through um, I'm not going through uh, this model in detail because of time constraints, but I'll say very briefly that uh, in this systemic functional model, translation competence is represented by a core competence interacting with a background competence through uh, the vital role and synergetic effect of uh, translation uh, strategic competence. The core competence consists of um, two fundamental skills, problem posing and problem solving. The former leads to the generation of multiple uh, hypotheses or solutions. In translation, this means producing more than one viable target text out of source text. The latter leads to a selection of one of the hypotheses or solutions. In translation, this means choosing one viable target text that can be deemed to be justifiably equivalent to the source text. The background competence includes all those competences that are not specifically translational, but they contribute to contextualize the core text, the core competence as required. Although this lie on the background, from the systemic functional perspective, they are considered neither hierarchical hierarchically organized, nor prerequisite for translation competence, as they coexist but can be activated individually to add diverse features and meanings to the translational task uh, and process. The model aims at creating a synergetic interaction of language and translation competences. If we compare the development of language competence against translation competence, it is easy to note how language teaching will be more likely to target the upper part of the background competences, that is the um, linguistic, the extralinguistic, and the sociocognitive competences. While uh, the teaching of translation competences will be more likely to address the lower part of the background competences, specifically the epistemological, the instrumental, and the professional competences. Attention is not focused on any of the elements in particular, but on the network of interrelationships that come into play. Now, how do we operationalize this model? That is to say, how do we go about turning our model into an operating agenda? Within the systemic functional model, the epistemological competence is a point of entry that provides the framework that explains how the subject is organized. It provides insights into its conceptual relevance, that is to say the facts, the concept, the rules and the methods typical of the subject or subjects. 
uh, it provides also insights into its cognitive significance, that is to say the mental processes, motivations and attitudes developed through learning that specific subjects. And it also provides insight into its social utility, that is to say the external relations and the context of views. And um, it is a competence that, or sub-competence, that informs the whole system. In um, content-based learning, we need to analyze both subjects together, um, that is, both the language and the content, in order to point out common frame features uh, that might facilitate learning. Now, the analysis of the conceptual relevance will suggest how to organize the objects of teaching, how to order them in their mutually uh, useful logical sequence, and how to control the complexity of the ensuing system. Let's assume that after analyzing the conceptual relevance and cognitive significance of the subjects, law, and language, we've come to the resolution that one of the main nodes for, say, language and translation students is contract law and language of contracts. How do we organize the teaching and learning activities according to your translation-oriented language pedagogy? Well, first of all, we determine what items of the individual competences we would like our students to target, referring to the nodes, language and contracts. Starting from the epistemological competence, we determine what to teach in terms of concepts and methods of contract law and legal language that is most relevant and significant to learners in both systems, the linguistic and the legal system. Then, guided by the model, we select the facts, rules, principles to be treated. We highlight any non-equivalence between the systems. Finally, we derive the methods of the integrated subjects and the appropriate tools to be uh, used in order to deal with some conceptual issues. We determine that students need to achieve epistemic fluency. That is to say, the ability to recognize and practice a culture's epistemic forms. Uh, that is the target structures that humans use to construct knowledge to understand the different forms of expressions and evaluation, and to take the perspective of in the interlocutors who are operating within epistemic frameworks. Here, Collins' idea of epistemic forms, coupled with the writer's notions of conceptual artifacts, can be used to help students understand how they should be representing new knowledge within a professional culture. So, for instance, the different types of contracts are studied from the legal point of view in both legal systems, civil and common law, and from the linguistic point of view of both languages, the own language and the additional language, L1 and L2. Lexical grammar patterns, uh, such as collocations, colligations, semantic preference and semantic prosody, but also the study of modality, for instance, are examined and compared by working on LSP, Language for Special Purposes, comparable and parallel corpora that students learn to investigate. In order to complete their translation tasks, which they will revise individually, in small groups, or in the larger class group, according to professional practices. The aim for learners is to achieve communicative um, action skills. That is the ability for the self-reflective subject 
to justify action to those affected by it. In this context, language and translations are uh, practiced seamlessly, as almost seamless is the, um, um, the study of the legal system involved and uh, also the application of digital technology to the legal context used to enhance professional communication. Content-driven language pedagogy receives a boost from interdisciplinary, um, uh, real-world, open-ended problems that require cooperation between uh, content and language lecturers and between learners in small groups. Motivation is the spring that triggers the whole learning process. During classes, uh, students come up with, um, uh, with real-world queries for which they had found no appropriate solutions or no solutions at all. Rather than help them find the sought-after solution, the lecturer's task is to provide our students with a methodology they can apply when needed. This will empower students and increase their awareness of their own interlinguistic and intercultural skills. And this is the way the methodology can be applied. Uh, after going through the first intralinguistic semasiological stage, that is the uh, reconstruction of the meaning from a given word or term in the source language, L1, student needs to go through the second stage, uh, an interlinguistic onomasiological stage, um, that uh, is uh, used to designate the concept in the target language. As this is a complex task, the best way to handle it is to unpack it into various steps, which, although presented subsequently, actually uh, they progress together as if they were the two strands in the double helix of the DNA structure. Um, step one is um, at the semasiological level, and it starts with conceptualizing the source language term generally by using monolingual dictionaries or, or the web. Um, step two, uh, at the onomasiological level, is a problem solving, a problem posing step. It concerns the generation of multiple hypotheses of possible target terms. In order to do that, each student looks the word up in a specialized bilingual or multilingual dictionary to find possible equivalents for the term. Step 1b gets back to the semasiological level. It reiterates the uh, semasiological stage, this time, however, in the target language, and is aimed at cross-checking the meaning of the target language hypothesis. Step 2b goes back to the onomasiological level and is meant to hone the hypothesis by creating a pool of candidate terms. After that, step 1c gets back to the semasiological stage and tests the meaning of the candidate terms that reveal to be most plausible uh, against the concept and definition of the searched source language term. Then we move to the final onomasiological uh, step, step 2c which is a problem-solving step, as it concerns the selection of the target language term out of the pool of candidate terms. And finally, we go back to the semasiological level uh, with step 1D, 
that requires the verification of both domain and context of the selected target language term. The search is individual, while the discussion of the search results is socialized at class level, thus gradually expanding the concept map that the group of students is co-constructing. Students are thus involved in a process of observation, that is also self-observation, and monitoring, uh, that is also self-monitoring, of their own knowledge construction processes. Attention is therefore paid not really on the results achieved, but rather on the processes started to achieve them, especially because nothing really prevails more than students' own perception of achievement and empowerment. So, in order to see how this methodology translates into practice, we'll now apply it to a specific case. One such case, as reported by a student, concerned the concept of uh, caparra confirmatoria in a real estate rental contract. The students had already discussed the Italian term with the content lecturer and had a clear idea of its meaning and the difference between the two types of capara in the Italian law, uh, which is capara confirmatoria and capara penitenziale. Um, that is why the former has the function of self-protection and prevented liquidation of the damages in the event of non-fulfillment by the counterpart, not a lawsuit or resort court process and with no limits of the compensable damages. The latter refers to some kind of consideration for the right of withdrawal provided in favour of one or both of the contract parties and are predetermined by them. Now, the, um, these definitions are translations uh, um, referring back to the uh, article of the Civil Code, the Italian Civil Code. In the case of Capara Confirmatoria, it's Article 1385. And in the case of Capara Penitenziale, it's Article 1386. So after uh, Step 1a, uh, which consisted in conceptualizing the source language uh, term, uh, we move to um, Step 2a, which is the uh, first problem posing step, which requires gearing up to use the upper part of the core competence in the translation competence model, which means generating multiple hypotheses, that is to say, producing more than one viable target text out of a source text. So in order to do that, each students looked um, um, Look the word up in a specialized bilingual or a multilingual dictionary to find possible equivalents for the term caparra, considering that they had not found any ready made collocation for caparra confirmatoria in the target language. So, um, what they found um, is um, the, from the Multilingual um, West's Law and Commercial Dictionary by Zanicali and West, um, they found uh, um, some hypotheses to be checked against the specific context, of course, um, um, as, uh, as shown in this list. Bug and money, earnest, earnest money, hand money, and Ara. The Bilingual Economics and Business uh, Dictionario e Enciclopedico Economico e Commerciale 
by Danny Kelly offered three hypotheses. Again, bargain money, again, earnest money, and some token money, uh, which was uh, really not the, uh, not exactly the um, type of um, entry that we would have expected also because um, um, there is no corresponding term from uh, English into uh, Italian and vice versa. However, um, consolidating the results found, the students noted how all the entries um, expressed the concept of caparra as money, which would not cover the entire legal meaning of the term caparra in the Italian law, for which it is either a sum of money or a quantity of other fungible things. Um, so, um, we'll move to step uh, 1b. Here students reiterated the semasiological stage, this time in the target language, while testing the meaning of the dictionary a hypothesis that revealed to be most plausible, uh, in this case, bargain money and earnest money, against the concept and definition of caparra. The search was individual, while the discussion of the search results was socialized at class level, uh, thus gradually expanding the concept map that the group of students was co-constructing. Um, the Dizionario Enciclopedico Economico e Commerciale offered the following definition for this entry in its English-Italian section. Bargain money, a um, sum of money paid by the buyer at the time of concluding a contract to indicate the buyer's intention and ability to fulfill the contract. Often the contract provides that the, that the money is lost if the buyer defaults. Um, another dictionary, the West Law and Commercial Dictionary, by Zanikali and West, offered the following uh, definition for this entry in its uh, English-Italian section. Earnest money, a sum of money paid by a buyer at the time of entering a contract to indicate the intention and ability of the buyer to carry out a contract. Normally, such earnest money is applied against the purchase price. Often, the contract provides for the feature of the sum if the buyer defaults. A deposit of part-time payment of purchase price on sale to be consummated in future. This is what um, it is. Um, now, the um, students became aware of the shortcomings of their search outcome and realized how limited and limiting dictionaries can be, and that they required new tools to investigate possible equivalences of the search pattern. They therefore upgraded their instrumental competence by working with online and offline general and specialized corpora, aiming at both verifying the suitability of the dictionary entries to the target context and extending or restricting the research scope in order to find new, more plausible hypotheses to verify in the specific legal context. In step 2b, students were taught how to generate new hypotheses by studying the collocational profile of the source terms and of the target candidates, as well as their semantic preferences. After searching Capara Confirmatoria on online Italian general and specialized corpora, and checking that the prima facie equivalent um, confirmatory could not be used in the same context and domain as the source language and culture. They noted 
a superordinate word that could encompass the broader nature of caparra in the Italian legal system. The hypernym deposito here, as you can see, which they could use later in the problem solving step to see. Now, a couple of words about the corpora investigated and the relevant results. Sketch Engine's Italian Web 2016 corpus contains um, approximately 5 billion tokens. Sketch Engine's Eurolex Italian 2016 corpus contains uh, more than 6,000 million tokens. However, more, unex more unexpectedly, um, your Lex Italian 26 corpus returned uh, 121 occurrences of Caparra, but no occurrence of Caparra Confirmatoria, although it was specialized. So, oddly enough, the more general Italian Web 2016 corpus, on the contrary, returned uh, approximately 12,000 occurrences of Caparra and um, more than uh, 1,300 occurrences of Caparra Confirmatoria. Similarly, after searching the only near equivalent found so far for the term capara confirmatoria, that is, earnest money on online English general and specialized corpora, students noted the same superordinate word referred to earnest money, that is, deposit. Also in the variant security deposit. And the synonym down payment, which is, however, more typically associated to the term anticipo than caparra. The context in which the terms appeared was related to contracts and real estate transactions. Therefore, students only needed to check the legal meaning of the term deposit, security deposit, against the term caparra, caparra confirmatoria to make sure that they had found a match. But before going through this semasiological reconstruction of the terms, there was a final step that they needed to take at this stage. Students realized that when working with available online corpora, large specialized corpora might not exactly cover the specific domain they needed to investigate and that a customer's corpus, even though smaller, might cater for their needs most effectively. They also realized that they needed to start discriminating between US and British English, because the two countries certainly shared many features, including the common law system, but they could also have developed quite different attitudes, behaviors and rules in their legal cultures. They were then walked through the use of corpus analysis tools to investigate a small but representative corpus of contracts of various types, sales, lease, rent contracts, and so on, built in US and British English. First of all, students noted how unexpectedly none of the UK contracts or US contracts contained the term earnest money, which was on the contrary the top or only choice of both specialized dictionaries and online database, uh, such as the European database. Most importantly, 37 out of the 631 hits for deposit in the UK contracts corpus and 126 out of the 220 hits for deposit in the US contracts corpus, reported the term security deposit in connection with lease contracts or tenancy agreements 
and with a similar legal meaning as capara confirmatoria. In this final onomasiological step, the target language term is selected out of a pool of candidate terms. In this case, the selected, um, the selected um, term is security deposit. By expanding with far view the context of one of the concordance lines in the US contract corpus, students discover that the legal notion of security deposit is regulated by a specific law in the USA. Therefore, they had evidence enough to be sure that security deposit was an appropriate match for capara confirmatoria. Anticipating the final step, step 1D, we can already see that the definitions of security deposit in West's Law and Commercial Dictionary matches the uh, Italian concept of capara confirmatoria as it describes the security deposit as a sum of money paid by a buyer at the time of entering a contract to indicate the intention and ability of the buyer to carry out the contract. And it continues by equating it, equating security deposit with earnest money, which was the initial designation students had found on, on bilingual dictionaries, which however couldn't be found in the corpus of contracts. After giving a cursory glance at the security deposit law, students also understood that the English term security deposit denotes not only capara confirmatoria, but also deposito cauzionale, down payment, which is what happens with the notion of capara confirmatoria in the Italian legal context. According to case law, the nature of the capara confirmatoria is composite and its function is eclectic. It is in fact valid as a guarantee of performance of the contract since it is destined to be defeated, defeated in the event of default by the counterparty. And from this point of view, it can be equated to a down payment, cauzione. It also allows the party, by way of self-protection, autotutela, to withdraw from the contract with, without the need to turn to a judge. And finally, it has the function of preventive and flat rate liquidation of the damages, deriving from the withdrawal to which the party was forced due to the non-fulfillment of the other party. And this is also confirmed by the definition of um, that the Black's, Black's Law Dictionary gives of security deposit, that is, a cash or bond that is given into another's custody as a guarantee of performance or to secure possession or occupancy. To recap, by working on the collocational profile of both source language term and target language term, and by applying the alternating steps of the semasiological and onomasiological stages, students could find an answer to the question, can security deposit be considered an equivalent of capara confirmatoria? Therefore, the term security deposit seems to be closer to the notion of capara confirmatoria in the context of rental agreements than two other terms that surfaced after investigating the US and UK corpora collected and after searching the web, that is, uh, earnest money deposit in the US corpus uh, used exclusively in real estate purchasing mm -hmm. and booking fee in the UK corpus more related to students' housing, both of which can be considered the equivalents of caparra 
thus leaving the term security deposit to more aptly denote capara confirmatoria. This lengthy description of how students were guided through gradual approximations to their own discoveries, um, in some cases even uh, epiphanies, um, and were empowered, uh, well, it reflects the goals and learning objectives that uh, were negotiated and shared when discussing the language and content focus skills for the language and contract nodes um, at the um, model level. And also the conceptual artifacts, um, that is to say the plans, the problem formulations, the proposals, the interpretation and criticisms to be used to achieve them. The process itself is shorter since it is not linear. Now, in order to transfer the newly acquired methodology to a different context, the case of secure tenant in British rental agreements was explored with a class so as to find a possible equivalent in the Italian language and legal culture. This is the concept map built uh, out of the individual contributions uh, shared and discussed in the class group while applying the um, translation methodology of the alternating semasiological and onomasiological stages in brief, the DNA metaphor methodology to the case of secure tenant. To sum up the consolidated application of the uh, translation oriented language and content focused model significantly enhanced uh, students' language and translation competence and their communicative skills as uh, English foreign language learners, while raising their motivation and networking skills. Uh, the contribution of learning motivation and metacognitive skills enhanced learners' systematic use of strategies that, in turn, supported their development as independent and empowered learners. And this is a small bibliography for your perusal with some links to the resources used in this presentation. Thank you for watching. I'll leave you with a slogan for a more inclusive world, including the language and translation viewpoint.